Why and how are brand new Teslas leaking oil? And people may hate the Cybertruck, but they're buying it at record pace. Plus, Tesla's RoboTaxi event is just days away, but Elon just teased a one more thing that's bigger than all of them. All that and more starts right now. All right, let's get right into it with this oil leak. How can <laughs> electric cars be leaking oil and what exactly is going on with this? Yeah, when he told me about the story, I was like, Kim, are you falling for another scam? <laughs> but, but no, this is just a headline that caught your attention. And of course, electric cars don't have engines, so there's no engine oil, but the motors do have oil and that's how you keep them lubricated. But it turns out the 2024 Refresh Model 3's performance variant has an issue and a lot of owners in recent months have reported oil leaking from that rear drive unit. And initially it's kind of hidden, but it eventually shows up. Tesla kind of discounted it as being an issue at first. Yes. Now they're taking blame. Yeah, so I thought this was really interesting because if you're the channel Tim, AKA OMG Tesla, as you may know him, actually discovered this. And when he first went in to have it looked at, they tried to say, oh, it's because you have aftermarket parts. Yeah, he had kind of replaced the control arms, I believe, on the front. He made it a point to really verbalize that, hey, that has nothing to do with the rear drive unit leaking oil. And again, it was the underbody shield, kind of the aerodynamic shield that had to be removed for you to be able to see the dripping of oil. And turns out, he has the social media platform on X with some 7,000 followers. He put it out there. A ton of other Tesla owners which came forward. The service center made him do, which I kind of <laughs> feel like is not the best customer service right there to be like, uh, we don't believe you. Let's see if you can find it with other people too. We've had we've had somewhat of a similar experience with people with the service center telling us that something is normal where we know it's not normal. And after kind of going back and forth a couple of times, they've agreed to move forward and looking at it carefully and, and come up with a solution. And this time around, Tim went on social media on X, posted it, owners come forward saying, yes, this has happened to us. And now apparently the engineers at Tesla are fully aware of it. Service center regional manager reached back out to Tim, said, we're working on a solution. We're going to put a bulletin out for this. And this is a known issue. And I think it's because of a faulty breather valve that is found in those new drive units it's that's causing this leak to take place. So it happens to almost every single one of them, at least that have been produced in recent months. And it's hard to see initially. So you've got to kind of either take that mm -hmm. cover off or it goes long enough to where it starts kind of seeping down beneath that aerodynamic cover. I wonder if there'll be an actual physical recall for yeah. Tesla, which we haven't really seen. This could be one of those of. unusual, rare physical recalls, you're right. Um, but it's really interesting. Do you guys own a Performance 2024 Model 3? And have you seen this oil leak on your vehicle? <laughs> Let us know in the comments below. Also, what have your service experiences been like with Tesla's customer service when you do go in? Have you had some weird ones? Let us know those in the comments below. I think it's always interesting to hear about other people's stories. You know, one of our service center here, the, the reps, we had an appointment for uh, a part of a bumper that had fallen off because the clip for it had uh, chipped and had fallen off. He came over, he was gonna charge us $100, $150, I think, to put a new a bumper clip on. And he's like, maybe I shouldn't tell you this. <laughs> I don't think he recognized me from the channel. You weren't there. And he, he's like, I, honestly, I've, I've fixed this myself. You can just get some professional adhesive for like $7 at, at Lowe's and, and do it yourself. And the sensors seem to be working fine. It's just that clip that's broken. So sure enough, I... Sign. What made me mad is that you did go and you did this yourself and you didn't even tell me about it. I'm like, hey, I could have made a video about this. This would be like, there's a lot of people out there looking to know how to fix these type of things. And this one over here just went and took care well, of it. Well, this advisor, what, what he told me was that this has happened on a lot of them, the new ones. It seems like within a couple of years, they get brittle. We're still under the warranty. This wasn't any sort of abuse that we had done. We still have well within our miles in this 22 Model X. And he said that Tesla has been really, really hammering down on the service reps to not give any sort of uh, goodwill gestures that they used to do back in the day where you know, you'd get small things, they'd cover them because it'd be minimal expense. But I mean, I guess that's how they keep their margins high and are mm -hmm. able to be profitable and, and succeed in this, in this market. But yeah, that's- I feel like there's a line though, like of, you know, being profitable and then also, you know, being thankful to your customers yeah. And, yeah. And, and having good service. So I don't know if they've, kind of cross that line. I, I know there are a lot of people that feel like they have. So yeah. I don't know, what has your experience 
then let us know in the comments. All right, so I want to move on because there are a lot of EVs that have just gotten Tesla supercharger access, and we're seeing people using extension cords with them now. We know that Tesla has the the uh, ports in the back, yeah. Yeah, it has the ports in the back, but not all EVs have the port in the same place. Yeah, it's So in order for them to charge, <laughs> they're using an extension cord, and now we have one of Tesla's main engineers going on saying, this might not be a good idea. Yeah, so this has happened here because, like you said, cars like the R1T, R1S, uh, have had to oftentimes use two supercharging stalls, and as you're beginning to see these automakers work their way into superchargers, an extension becomes something that people that are not in the Tesla world are like, oh, that makes sense. Let me Google. Well, there is an extension cable for superchargers and problem solved. But Wes Morrill, who is the lead engineer for the Cybertruck, he responded to someone commenting on these extension cables saying that these extension cables actually that are liquid cooled have a sensor within the handle, which really is an important feature to make sure they're not going to overheat. When you plug in an additional extension, you take away that feature, that safety feature that's in place. You're also adding an additional junction where the, the extension actually adds further heat to that area. So not only do you not have heat protection, you also have further heat building on that extension area. So it makes it a really dangerous setup. And some of the people actually uh, commented saying Tesla had promised their own extension cable, which is true. Mm -hmm. There's a, a message out there from Tesla Public Post that at the very bottom of it kind of suggests that they are actively working on a NACS to NACS extension cable, possibly exactly for these scenarios. But I feel like also like you have to realize that the amount of engineering that goes into these superchargers to make sure that they stay cooled and you get the speeds and all the things. And when you kind of tamper with that, you know, there's a possibility of things going wrong. Like a wet rag? Like the wet rag. <laughs> like that was causing overheating. Yeah. And they definitely said, don't do that. We've seen it all over TikTok, though. And so people get this idea and they're like, wow, what a great hack. But it's not really a good hack. Um, but then there are times where there's like adapters, like yeah. the one that we've been talking about yeah. here on, on our channel, where Tesla sues them and then actually goes back and says, actually... It's okay, go ahead yeah, and use it. Yeah, they just dropped that lawsuit, you're right. Yeah. EVject that we talked about previously, the lawsuit that was in place uh, from Tesla suing EVject because they were concerned about the heat uh, issues possibly with an adapter. They've now dropped that lawsuit. They're actively working with Tesla, as we've talked about in recent weeks. EVJet's actually taking back their, their ones that they've sold so far and replacing them with this new version that will have additional heat uh, protection built in within it. So Tesla, EVJet already told Tesla this was safe by our tests, but now they're actually following to Tesla's specific guidelines and taking back what they've sold and giving you a new version. Um, I love that. Yeah. I think it's great. And I feel like, you know, providing this education for customers and for aftermarket accessories and working together with everybody is one of the reasons why I love the company is that they do do that. You know, even if their customer service at times <laughs> could be questionable. Yeah. Um, overall, as a company, I feel like they're headed in the right um, path here, as well as like the amount of superchargers that have pretty much doubled isn't that crazy? There's yeah. a new report about this. New report from the Department of Transportation saying EV charging stalls have doubled since 2021. So just in the past three and a half, four years, we've now essentially seen an incredible expansion of EV charging with 192,000 EV charging uh, stations that are in the US and a thousand more every single week that are being added as well. This all comes in with, I think, a $520 million grant that was in place. Um, and another 9,000 stations are expected to be uh, rolled out as well. So, how do we know if these new stations are they like the Tesla NACS or are they CCS? Do we know? I think they're probably largely. Um, CCS at this point, I think. I haven't seen too many NACS pop up, but that, that's, that's definitely a cause for concern, right? Because we know a lot of these automakers are actively transitioning over. So, so I'm not sure exactly the ones that have rolled out this 190,000 from what I can tell when I pull up to non-Tesla chargers, I still need an adapter. So I think that's all still uh, CCS chargers that are in but place. But I read that Tesla was the biggest winner from this grant and they got the most amount of money for their chargers. So I think that we are seeing more of the NACS chargers or Tesla chargers. 
numbers. Yeah, so it looks like based on this uh, public report that just came out, 13% of all of the grants that were for EV charging went directly to Tesla. Tesla got about $17 million in this, in this infrastructure grant, and they used it to build some 41 charging stations, not stalls, 41 stations. So assume 10 to 20 per, we're talking several hundred stations that are in place here. Uh, which which is pretty pretty interesting to see because we've often seen Tesla's criticism or not Tesla's maybe Elon Musk's criticism of the current administration and it looks like Tesla's actually been able to tap in quite nicely into utilizing this this grant here at, at the most and they've been pretty effective in fact second place according to this EV adoption data that came out was an energy company Francis Energy out of Oklahoma they used about thirty million dollars and only built 37 charging stations. So Tesla used about half that and built a little bit less than that. So Tesla's done pretty well with the money they got as far as utilizing it for charging stations. And then if these companies are building charging stations, um, some of these charging stations now are having both NACS and CCS on That's them true. or they're updating. So you know, it's really up to how they use that money. And I, I could see them having more in ACS yeah, it's, um, it's to me. answer my own question <laughs> there about that. Um, but then also this week, GM just got access. Yeah, I was to gonna say, speaking of NACS, GM just as of this week. So anything from say Chevy Equinox EV, Silverado EV, of course, the Cadillac Lyric, you talk about the Hummer EV, all of these now get access to Tesla superchargers as of this week. But it's coming with a little bit of a cost. That adapter, yeah. which they've worked actively with Tesla in creating, is two hundred twenty-five dollars. Yeah, yeah, they're charging their customers <laughs> for the adapter, yeah. which is interesting because I know Ford and Rivian, at least for a limited time, they gave out yeah. the adapters, um, but now we're seeing GM charge for them, which is an interesting choice. I see, like, yes, it's costing them money to give them out. Um, so I kind of see both sides. How do you guys feel about this? Do you think that they should charge for these? In comparison, how much is the charger for Tesla to go NACS to CCS? How much? Do you know how much yes. Tesla charges? We paid initially two fifty, two hundred fifty dollars, I believe. Now I recently saw that it dropped down closer to one fifty, maybe even slightly less for that uh, NACS to CCS adapter. So it's it's a little bit less now, but again, earlier on, it yeah, was Yeah, but that's expensive. like almost half of what GM is charging, yeah. their own customers, <laughs> which seems crazy it's, to it's me. It's ruffled some feathers for sure within the GM community, uh, but they've publicized, GM publicized this saying, hey, good news, you're now getting access to 18,000 new charging stations that you didn't have access to last week. So that's kind of the price. I guess you're paying, but that kind of all goes with these adapters yeah. and extensions and things that people are going to need to utilize for now. But starting next year, GM will actually natively have these built into the And cars. also Tesla charges more for non-Tesla vehicles for the electricity. Yeah. So you are paying more for it if you don't drive a Tesla, but you have access. So I don't know. How do you guys feel about all this? In a way, as like a Tesla owner, I'm like, okay, that's not bad because that maybe it will help make our stations less busy. We know that we'll, we'll, that was a big fear for a lot of owners was if we open up the networks, like they're already crowded as it is, are they gonna be more crowded? So maybe charging will help with that kind of from the Tesla owner. But if you're looking at it as like EV adoption as a whole, you might feel differently. So how do you guys feel? Put it in the comments down below. I also want to talk a little bit about Cybertruck hate because I feel like I see a lot of headlines about Cybertrucks being vandalized. Um, I just Dean made a video about why people hate Cybertruck, but she still likes it and she bought one. And then we had one this last weekend and we parked and came back and somebody wrote on it and they wrote, Cybertruck is ugly. No, you are ugly or Cybertruck, your, your like car that. is ugly. It was something like that. Something like that yeah. on it. So we see so much hate towards the Cybertruck. And I feel like a lot of that is because of the politics right now, possibly. Mm. But um, at the same time, they're selling. They're selling like hotcakes. <laughs> I know. So according to a report that just came out looking at sale numbers uh, in July, Cybertruck in July of 2024, sold almost 5,200 trucks 
and you look at all the other major ones put together, R1T, Lightning, Silverado EV, Hummer EV, 5,500 combined for those four electric trucks put together. So in that same month, yeah. that continued. And Cybertruck actually that same month became the best-selling uh, vehicle of any type in the United States, over $100,000. So the price definitely is not turning people off, at least by the masses that are adopting a vehicle at this, at this price point. So what do you think it is? Do you think it's all the celebrity adoption? We're seeing a lot of, we saw Shaq, Kim Kardashian, you know, so many celebrities have posted pictures of their Cybertruck. Do you think that is a part of but it? in reality, that's not 5,500 celebrities. As many celebrities as we've seen pop up, maybe into the dozens. I, I don't think that's driving the sales, you know? So that's obviously as as questionable or as critical that people can be towards Tesla right now, especially as it relates to you know Elon Musk and, and his behavior online, maybe. Um, there's also on the other side of it where people are saying, hey, it's not just Elon that we see this. It's an incredible vehicle. All of them are. And they are filled with engineers and brilliant people outside of Elon that should also get some credit for what's happening here yeah. with these vehicles. So taking one person that you may or may not like and, and you know pinning it against them is, is probably not an active, a valid reason. But it's still surprising to me that out of all the electric trucks that are being sold right now, half of them are Cybertruck. <laughs> yes. And Which it, I think it's great. Like as an investor, I'm like, that's amazing. But it was a little bit surprising. That's why Tesla has said they're not dropping prices or, or you know not uh, moving into non-foundation uh, series vehicles quite yet because they're able to get sales at high volumes at this higher price point. So, you know, and, and Tesla's actually still make up about 48% of the EV market share right now in the United States. That's down from 56% this time last year. So we are seeing expansion from other automakers that are starting to sell at higher volumes, but still not catching up to Tesla quite yet. But in fact, if you look at the numbers here, the upswing shows 118,000 EVs uh, registered so far I believe in that month, whereas it was 101,000 a year ago into that same month. So these are EVs outside of Tesla. So again, more people adopting non-Teslas. Tesla's market share is shrinking a little bit, but people are still loving the truck. People love the truck, so that's pretty cool. And looking at all the other electric trucks out there right now that are maybe not selling quite as well as the Cybertruck. One of those would be Rivian. I absolutely love the R1T and I think it's an excellent truck, but they seem to have some plans to maybe make some more money. They've revamped their website, yeah. So they're now selling certified pre-owned Rivians on their website. There is a catch though, and we'll get to that in a second, but the trucks are listed for as little as $62,000, generally between five and 15,000 miles on the odometer. They're all 2023 models that are there. And with Rivians, even if you buy these pre-owned vehicles that have you know, 15, 20,000 miles on them, you're going to get a 60,000 mile warranty and a seven year or 175,000 mile warranty when it comes to the battery pack or the drivetrain. So you still have pretty extensive warranty you're left in place for years to come. Uh, and you can also actually return these vehicles within seven days of purchase, which is something we saw Tesla do years yeah. ago. Rivian is now going to embrace this for these CPOs. I think CPOs. it's also part of Rivian just growing up as a company, being able to do this, like a lot of other companies does, Tesla does, um, where you can trade in your old vehicle and then they'll resell it. Yeah. Yeah, and it really makes it for obviously an affordable entry point for a lot of people that maybe didn't want to be into the 70s. Now you're into the 60s for essentially a new truck directly from Rivian with all of those ben benefits that come with the warranties. But the catch, Kim, is that it's only available, the CPO program is only available in California and Illinois, the two most popular states for, for Rivian adoption. Of course, Illinois, the factory, California, just EV adoption being greater. So those two places have it right now. The other 48 states they're kind of still waiting um for for but future could you buy it in those states and then just you know if you're getting a good enough deal you can have it shipped oh, to know. wherever That's you live pleasure. maybe i don't know yeah. i really don't know um if there's any kind of like stipulation about that i guess you'd have to change the plate and yeah all that kind of stuff but you know if it's a good enough deal it might be worth it all right kim this is an ev that i think you've wanted for a long time to get your hands on it's not available in the u.s quite yet but new report coming out saying that BYD, if it were to enter the United States right now, even with the 100% tariffs that are set to go in effect for vehicles that are built in China that come into the US, 
even with that, it would still be cheaper than anything else available in the US right now. It would be about $25,000 with a 100% tariff on top of it. The cheapest price for a US EV from BYD would be about $12,000. So you factor in 100% tariff, that would get you up to almost $24,000, $25,000 or so after taxes. So it would still again be well below that price point of $30,000, which Tesla hasn't even been able to tap into yet. So. so how exactly is BYD able to keep their prices so low? Yeah, so they've had their supply chain going for a pretty long time time, Kim. So since 1996, that's been in place. In fact, the first phones that we all had, whether it was Motorola, the Razors, or, or the Nokia in the early 2000s, um, it was actually BYD's batteries that powered those phones back in the day. And even as early, as recently as 2020, they of course came through with the breakthrough batteries, the Blade batteries as well. And right there with CATL that offers some of Tesla's batteries, uh, BYD is a pretty competitive area when it comes to battery tech. So having all of that internally and that supply chain going back decades is a, a big part of why their prices are lower. So I keep thinking about our last story. If BUID came to the US, it would be like, it would kind of, that would be what people would be buying. So those I mean, numbers that's what it is everywhere skewed. else. Yeah. 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 They would be so skewed. Like I feel like BYD would really take over. But yeah. at this point, BYD doesn't have any plans to come to the US. Yeah, so they already are, are here in the US in the electric bus market. But yes, for passenger vehicles, their CEO said at this stage, they're not quite there yet, but they're confident that whenever that does happen, that they'll get a pretty good chunk of the market share because they're able to come in with such a low price, <laughs> even with those. Can you imagine if the tariffs weren't there? I mean, oh. I think this really goes to show you that EV adoption in the world is going to quickly out, outpace what's happening here in the US. Of course, I understand why the tariffs are in place, incentivizing businesses in, uh, to operate out of the United States and some of the unfair practices maybe that China uses when it comes to uh, labor laws out there. But uh, with EV adoption really expanding quickly outside of the United States, having prices right now available at ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars for a compelling EV. I mean, that's cheaper really, than just regular uh, yeah, cars, like would, gas cars or that used would be incredible cars. for EV adoption anywhere because there's so many other people that would love to have cheaper commutes and be able to, you know, utilize uh, an electric car. But twenty-five to thirty thousand is still way above their budget. But twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. I think the BYD Seal, which is the one that's available in mm -hmm. China, uh, is ten thousand base price, ninety-nine hundred or something base price. So these are available, and it's really slowing adoption down in the U.S. that we can't get those prices here yet, but that's where Model 2 might be, maybe comes in. What do you guys think about BYD? Do you want it here in the U.S.? Do you want it now? Would you actually trade in your Tesla for one of these BYD <laughs> cars? Let me know in the comments below. I'm kind of curious what that will do to Tesla when it eventually it comes to the U.S., like what will happen? Yeah, I mean, if it's built in the U.S., I think it'll be adopted and embraced more than if it were built outside the U.S. But yeah, that'd be a very, very significant day for EVs here. It would. So it's kind of hard because you're like <laughs> a Tesla fan, but at the same time, like options are great and I'm all for EV adoption. I think that was like the master plan that really got a lot of us like following Tesla in the first place. So Anyways, how do you guys feel about it? Put it in the comments down below. So we need to talk about RoboTaxi. I feel like that is why people are watching this right now. And this week we saw some images of it. Yes, so the RoboTaxi images out of the Warner Brothers studio lot there in Burbank comes out with a nice bright yellow wrap, kind of going in with the whole cab theme. And it looked like it had dummy body panels. It resembled at least the general shape of it to uh, what we saw in Elon Musk's uh, autobiography there by Walter Isaacson. So kind of that shape of what we expect the cyber cap to look like. And that's essentially all we know. It looks like it still has a steering wheel from the, the shots that people are able to, able to zoom in on and see. But that's just about what we know so far. Yeah, I think that those are definitely going to be dummy panels. I don't think that, I think they're trying to hide the overall shape of it. So that will be a surprise on October 10th. Um, at this point, we know that it's going to be on some kind of closed loop because, mm -hmm. which will be the Warner Brothers lot, because yeah. they don't have the permits for autonomous vehicle driving without a driver yet. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So other companies, you know, Waymo has them for parts of California and into even Arizona and also recently in Texas and Georgia. Tesla yeah. doesn't have all that yet. So they've got yeah. to have a driver in the driver's seat, except if it's done on private property, i.e. Warner Brothers lot. 
Yes. <laughs> and then speaking of what you just said with Waymo, do you think that it they'll follow sort of that similar release? Like Waymo started with like some bigger metropolitan cities in like a closed loop within mm -hmm. that city, and now they're trying to broaden that. Do you think that's what Robotaxi will do? Gosh, you would imagine they're going to get you know a, a quicker jump start into all of it since Waymo's already done it once. So if they are able to piggyback and do it in some of these same cities, that's an option. And or, also the way they do FSD yeah. is completely different. Like with this vision approach and like versus the what is it the mapping approach There's Waymo a mapping has. Mapping approach of Waymo with people monitoring it actively in a room somewhere to make sure it's it's you know doing it the right way. Yeah. This is going to be different. So yeah, I, I really don't know where regulatory approval stands on some of this stuff, but it's happening. Happening, and we're going to learn hoping, so much about it. Yeah, and I'm hoping that at the event they'll talk a little bit about that, like what the plan is for like release, how far out we're looking at. Is this something that's like a year away, or will it be like Cybertruck, where it took four years after it was first unveiled? Yeah. Yeah, but I think we'll definitely be seeing the latest version of FSD, which is. Robotaxi or CyberCab? What are we calling it now? CyberCab or Robotaxi? CyberCab is what I saw. But I mean, yeah, it's going to have its own app, it looks like. You'll be able to hail rides. Maybe they'll let us do that while we're there in person and, and utilize this app that they'll make available. Okay. So, But yeah. the one more thing. <laughs> Every Tesla event has a one more thing, and we know that this event does have one. During the July 23rd earnings call, Elon said that moving it back a few months, as you guys recall that it was originally supposed to be in August, um, it allowed us to improve the RoboTaxi as well as add a couple of other things for the product <laughs> unveil. So there's the one more thing, and I have some ideas of what I think it could be. Okay, what do you got? All right. One, I think that we are going to have Optimus there, and I think Optimus is going to be like making food for us, doing something to help us. But I also think that the main one more thing is going to be this wireless charging pad that we kind of talked about last week a little bit. Yeah, we just reported last week that Tesla has applied for patents there from the International Patent Office directly related to inductive wireless charging pads. So whether that's coming into our garage, which they've previously teased wireless charging pads coming to our home, or in this case, possibly being for a robo taxi and something that they unveil and say, hey, first, you're going to get these in your house here starting next week at the shop, you can order it. And then we're eventually gonna roll these out to our you know, cyber cab services. I think that definitely could be the part of the one more thing. I like your robot thinking though. That's what do you fascinating guys, too. What do you guys think? <laughs> also these patents, by the way, have auto docking on them. Yeah. So to make sure that you're getting like the best charging, it's going to the right spot. Yeah. So it just really makes sense that this would be for this robo taxi to like, drive up over <laughs> it and it would automatically yeah. dock and do everything it really kind of like the two sort of fit together and with these patents you know them filing for them right now and the event being a couple days away to me it's like there's going to be something for Which that. Which ones going to be? I, maybe yeah. Model 2. I think when this first leak came out last week of these yellow, this yellow cyber cab that was spotted, I think people said that could be the Model 2 or maybe the Model 2 is the one more thing. And that's something that Tesla's hinted for a long time is coming in the next year. Yeah. So we're pretty much close to next year at this the point. Model 2, <laughs> they'll release next year with the steering wheel, but yeah. it will be the same vehicle Maybe same as platform, robo, yeah, yeah, maybe a as robo vehicle. taxi, but without the steering wheel. Yeah, so it could be the and model maybe two. the seats that turn. You know, like we've seen some of those like images of the seats facing each other. Yeah. So maybe that would be like part of it. What do you guys think? Put it in the comments below. And I really want to thank our Patreon members for helping to support this channel. This podcast is because of you guys, and you can listen to it on all major platform streaming devices as well. Yeah, Patreon members, they get exclusive access to this podcast, early release of this podcast, never before seen footage, one-on-one -on -one Q and A's with Kim and I, and also uh, so much more discounts too as well across Yeah, we actually items. have a couple things up our sleeve that we are going to be offering to Patreon members that I'll be putting out here soon. But I'm I'm going to keep this quiet for now. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.